Hello Saints. Today we're going to take a look at Hebrews. And uh, you know, we're going to specifically look at who wrote Hebrews, why it's written, who it's written to, what dispensation it falls under, and who Hebrews is not written to. Probably the most important of all these questions combined is the last one. Who Hebrews is not written to. Now, we know already that in order to understand God's Word, we have to do something that's called right division. And in this case, answering the question, who wrote Hebrews, is part of rightly dividing. Because we know that uh, in order to understand this, we need to ask ourselves these questions of who, what, where, when, how, and why concerning Hebrews. And in order to understand you know, what God is trying to tell us here, in this fantastic book. Now the one thing that causes the most confusion in Christendom is taking something God says uh, you know for someone else and then twisting it around and making it look and sound like he's talking to us today when he's not okay and this causes all kinds of problems. Now first let's look at when the book was written According to the more correctly divided sources, I found that it was written around 67 AD. Now second, what dispensation is the book written for? We know that this book is written, obviously by the title itself, for the nation of Israel. It's about the end days leading up to the 70th week of Daniel, the time within the 70th week, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and it leads into the 1000 year millennium. So, so far we've uncovered some very important information. The most important is that it's for the nation of Israel and not to the body of Christ today. Now, sure, okay, all scripture is inspired and it is for us. We can learn from it, but we need to understand that it's not written to us today. This is this being very important, okay? This is very important to understand. Now, several of the church fathers down through the ages speculated that the writer of Hebrews could have been Barnabas, uh, could have been Apollos or Luke, and also Paul, and dozens of others, okay? Dozens of other sources can be found everywhere you look. Now, another very important aspect to all this is the message. What's the message of Hebrews? Knowing the message, we can then backtrace to the people being spoken to. Then we can, from there, discover the dispensation at hand. Then we can find out who most likely wrote the book, okay? So the message, what's the message here? What's the author of Hebrews trying to convey to his audience here? In Hebrews, 2 we read uh, in Hebrews 2 3 to 5 how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection to the world to come, whereof we speak. Now, on a side note, but very important regarding this topic, is how Paul starts each of his 13 books in the Bible, okay? Now, notice in Romans, it begins, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. In 1 Corinthians, it starts out, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. In 2 Corinthians, it starts out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it continues on. In Galatians, it starts out, Paul, an apostle. In Ephesians, it starts out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. In Philippians, it starts out, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. In Colossians, it starts out, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. 
in 1 Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus also unto the church of the Thessalonians which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians it starts out Paul and Silvanus and T uh, Timotheus. Okay? In 1 Timothy it starts out Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ. Again in 2 Timothy Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ. In Titus Paul a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. In Philemon Paul a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Take notice that each one of Paul's books begins with his name, okay? And Hebrews doesn't doesn't at all. All right? 13 books written by Paul all have his name in it. And he did that for a reason. Remember in 2 Thessalonians there was there was a forgery going around, okay? And Paul mentions that he had signed all his writings. Now, okay, we notice in Hebrews that it wasn't signed, all right? Now, the writer of Hebrews focused on the world to come. This involves Israel's future, the redemption and restoration of the nation of Israel. The book of Hebrews doesn't involve the but now picture or the flavor of writing that Paul's books do. The Apostle Paul's 13 books, okay, it speaks of our dispensation, the dispensation of grace for us today, writing, uh, written to us and for us in this time, in this age, okay. Here in Hebrews, we see something different. As Paul's books revolve around today's gospel, the book of Hebrews focuses on another period, specifically early acts and the four gospels the beginning and the last days of israel's program the teachings of hebrews are built around the foundation of jesus's early uh, earthly ministry matthew matthew through john but concerning paul however paul didn't know jesus before the ascension okay in second corinthians 5 16 wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh yea Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Paul never based his writings nor his ministry uh, based on Christ's early earthly ministry, okay, as seen in the Old Testament and in the books of Matthew, Matthew through John, all right, and also in uh, in the books of uh, Peter's books, okay, and the other ministries. Now they're completely separate. One teaches the gospel of the kingdom. The others teach the gospel of grace. Two programs, two different dispensations, meant for two different groups. Okay, We see an example of what Paul's ministry was all about in Acts 19. Paul here is talking to King Agrippa. The king giving Paul permission to explain to everyone just what was going on with Paul. Why the sudden change with Paul? First, Paul was killing and jailing everyone who believed in Jesus. Now, Paul is preaching a completely different message. We see here in Acts 19, Acts 19, 13 through 17. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee also the writer of Hebrews had been taught doctrine second hand okay the second thing that stands out here is that this specific occurrence okay shows 
that this writer, the author of Hebrews, had been taught uh, the doctrine, like I said, secondhand, a different situation from Paul. Paul was neither taught by men nor by prophecy, nor did he seek to be taught by either of those. But Paul was taught by direct revelation from our risen Lord Jesus himself. We see a glimpse of this secondhand teaching here in Hebrews. Hebrews 2 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now, we know Paul never received secondhand information from the 12. Okay, look at Galatians with me. Galatians 1 11 to 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul writes, okay, when he discusses how he met with the apostles in Jerusalem. In Galatians 2 6, but of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever, they were it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference again added nothing to me. Okay? In fact, the twelve didn't teach Paul anything, but Paul actually taught them something. Reading further in Galatians 2, you'll see how Paul taught the twelve further revelations about God's plan and the purpose for mankind. You'll also see more of this in Acts 15. Now, a third thing that stands out. In relation to Paul not being the author of Hebrews is how the author here stands outside of Israel's apostleship okay let's examine some of this in Hebrews 2 3 to 5 how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him that's very important by them that heard him now we know, okay, I'll continue. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of Holy Ghost, okay, of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Take notice of how the author refers to the people who actually heard Jesus in his earthly, his early ministry as them that heard him, okay. The writer says, what they heard, we heard from them. In other words, the writer is someone who's not present in Matthew through John, okay? But someone who was present during Christ's early, uh, earthly ministry, okay? It was the one taught the, the writer of Hebrews, okay? So knowing this, we can eliminate Peter, James, John, and the rest of the other 12 as penning the book of Hebrews. These people were all first-hand hearers, okay? They witnessed the miracles and wonders that Jesus did firsthand. Again, keep in mind that Paul wasn't taught by anyone other than Jesus himself. Paul hadn't received anything from the 12 or the prophecies written Jesus alone was Paul's teacher of the gospel through revelation. Okay, it was kept a it was hidden, uh, it was kept a secret. It, the mystery gospel of grace, the body of Christ being built, was a mystery, making us fellow heirs with God's Son Jesus Christ. Now Paul learned this straight from Jesus. Okay, not from the twelve, or from Jesus uh, d during the earth the early ministry, but here in Hebrews. We're seeing someone who did receive his information and teaching from men, okay? The complete opposite from what Paul tells us in his books. Now, we're starting to see the separation a little clearly now, okay? That Paul could not be the author of Hebrews, okay? Moving on. The fourth situation that seems to stand out here is the fact that Paul signed all his letters personally. And we see attempts at forging Paul's signature 
when uh, we read Second Thessalonians 2, someone had been forging Paul's name on documents, telling everyone that the rapture had already happened and the Thessalonians uh, were already in the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, uh, the seven-year tribulation. But we know by the end of Paul's letter that it wasn't the case. And Paul clearly confirms that he signs all his letters with his own hand, even writing large at times because Paul's eyesight was bad. Hence his writing was bad. And also it's the reason why Paul needed others to write his letters for him. Okay, there's rumors out there that Paul, for some reason, didn't sign this book of Hebrews that he forgot or he just didn't bother doing it. Well, it doesn't sit right with his style, okay, or for the very reason why he signed his letters, to avoid counterfeit letters from being mistaken as his own. Another excuse going around is that Paul didn't sign this particular letter because he knew the Jews didn't like him, okay, which makes, again, no sense at all when you consider the reason why Paul was signing his writings. Paul wasn't signing his writings to be cool or to make uh, you know himself look important to those reading them. This wasn't about pride. Paul signed his letters for security reasons, okay? Our modern version of anti-forgery systems back in Paul's day. Paul mentioned several times why he signed his letters. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3.17 the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Again, in Colossians, Colossians 4.18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, grace be with you. Amen. Paul never wrote anything without signing his name to it, period, either before or after. In Romans, the two Corinthian epistles uh, in Galatians, in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the two Thessalonian epistles, the two epistles of Timothy, the, the epistle to Titus, and the epistle to Philemon, all these epistles begin with the name Paul. Unlike the books of Romans through Philemon, the book of Hebrews neither begins nor does it end with Paul's name. Now, if Paul claimed that he signed every epistle he wrote and there's no name signed in the book of Hebrews, then we have to conclude that Paul just didn't write Hebrews. Okay? Common sense. Would Paul say that he signed every epistle he wrote, but then break his word and write an epistle without signing his name? No, it, it just doesn't make sense at all. Okay? That, you know, that's most certainly... Un, uh, uncharacteristic of an apostle of Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews simply begins with the name God. And ultimately, the author of Hebrews is God the Holy Ghost. The human writer is anonymous. For reasons unknown to us, God purposefully withheld the name of the human instrument he uses. Now, the reason people try to put Paul as the ghost writer of Hebrews, you know, most often than not, they have an agenda. That's the reason. And the only way their agenda works is to mix the body of Christ with what's being said in Hebrews for the nation of Israel. They're trying to mix, they're trying to turn Israel into the church, okay? Replacement theology. Now, these, these types tend to hate dispensational teaching and write division. And they, they lean heavily towards a works-based salvation instead of faith alone, the gospel of grace that Paul taught exclusively at times. Now, uh, it, the writer of Hebrews wrote pre-AD 70, okay? And we see the temple still in operation here. Israel is still under law. Clearly, the dispensation here is different than the dispensation of grace, salvation by faith alone. Take uh uh, look at Hebrews 8 4 for if he were on earth he should not be a priest seeing that <clears throat> there are priests that offer gifts according to the law and also in Hebrews 8 13 in that he saith a new covenant he hath made the first old now that which decayeth and waxed old is ready to vanish away 
in Hebrews 10 11 and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins if we look at the grammar in the verses I just read we see it in the present tense meaning the Levitical priests were still offering sacrifices at the temple following the laws of Moses so we can deduce that the temple will still it was still standing Rome hadn't destroyed it just yet and therefore we know the book of Hebrews was written prior to 70 AD now the writer of Hebrews teaches a works based salvation look at Hebrews 5 9 and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto them unto all them that obey him Paul's ministry was all about salvation by grace alone salvation by believing and trusting alone salvation was a very different than it was prior to the ascension of our Lord Jesus the Apostle Paul preached and wrote about receiving the Holy Spirit by believing the gospel not by obeying God's laws like in Acts 2 okay which teaches repentance and water baptism <clears throat> and all that now we see what Paul taught one example here is in Romans 4 1 through 5 uh, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found for if Abraham were justified by works he hath whereof to glory but not before God for what saith the scripture Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness in Ephesians 1 13 and 14 in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory Ephesians 2 8 and 9 for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast now in contrast Hebrews 5 fits more with what Peter and the others taught in Acts 5 okay we see here in Hebrews 5 9 and being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him look at how closely it compares to what Acts says here okay Acts 5 9 notice it's interesting Hebrews 5 9 and Acts 5 9 and we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him also the same verse Hebrews 5 9 agrees with what Peter preached in Acts 2 in Acts 2 38 then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost again in Hebrews 5 9 it agrees perfectly with what Jesus taught in Mark 16 16 he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned okay we see also that this agrees entirely with the words of James in his famous faith and works treaties it's clear Hebrews 5 9 is far removed from our gospel today it's completely different than our dispensation of grace the salvation by faith alone so what does this mean okay it means that if Paul had written Hebrews 5 9 he would have been preaching two different gospels at the same time all right causing confusion further separating the Jews from the Gentiles instead of preaching the new gospel of grace you know salvation for both Jews and Gentiles under the same dispensation this gospel of Hebrews directly opposes the other gospels that Paul wrote okay now 
the seventh thing we need to look at is the word shepherd. Notice here in Hebrews 13, verse 20. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Never once does Paul call our Lord Jesus our shepherd. But we do notice the word shepherd in relation to Jesus here. Okay, it fits with how Peter and the rest preached. Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not by filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now you'll notice here with careful study that these verses are a continuation of of what Jesus says in John chapter 10. Okay, he's talking about how he's Israel's shepherd. Also, in the Old Testament, we, we know, uh, you know, being written to and for the Jews makes reference to God being Israel's shepherd. We see this in Psalm 23, Psalm 80, Isaiah 40, Zechariah 13, etc. Now, number eight, the eighth thing that stands out has to do with the blood of the everlasting covenant. Look here at Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. If you read Hebrews 10, 1 through 22, you'll see that Israel would be saved according to the new covenant, ratified by Jesus Christ's shed blood. Now, never once did Paul teach to the Jews anything about being saved on the basis of a new covenant. Israel's chance of accepting their Messiah came to a close by Acts uh, chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen long before Paul started his ministry. You can check out all everything that Paul wrote, Romans through Philemon, and you'll find no reference to any covenants associated with his ministry. Paul's ministry was salvation by the grace of God. The prophetic program for the nation of Israel involved covenants. There's a difference. And our program, the mystery program, has no covenant. Okay, It, it was a secret held within God for after Israel uh, rejected all their covenants and the Messiah. So then God would start to build the body of Christ, okay? A covenant-free relationship with God. Salvation by belief and trust in Christ Jesus according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now, the ninth thing that stands out is in Hebrews 13, 14. For here... We have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. This is, in, is uh, reminiscent of the petition uttered in the Our Father's Prayer, or the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, in Matthew 6.10. Paul wasn't waiting for the New Jerusalem to come. Okay, That would be a believing Jews, uh, that their hope in uh, Israel's program. Now, as a believer, a member in the body of Christ, Paul would be waiting to go up to heaven. See 2 Timothy 4.18. Members of the body of Christ have a hope to enter God's heavenly kingdom. Members of Israel's little flock have a hope of having God's kingdom come down to them on earth. Okay, and we see that in Revelation 21. So, Another thing that stands out, does it really matter whether or not we believe Paul wrote Hebrews? I mean, are we, you know, splitting hairs and bringing up the matter? But 
can we really be dogmatic about it you know certainly it's a serious matter and i've come to understand that it does matter what we believe about the book of hebrews let me explain people who claim that paul wrote hebrews often urge us to claim israel's blessings and promises they teach that we're spiritual israel okay you see they believe that acts chapter 2 is the beginning of the church uh, the body of christ and that leads them to believe paul wrote hebrews it's a problem of not understanding dispensations and right division if they want us to replace israel they usually believe paul wrote hebrews it's the book of hebrews is it not hebrews who is it written to hebrews okay the, those promises in hebrews still apply to the world to come but not to this present day one of the most damaging results of accepting the notion that paul wrote hebrews is when you begin to wonder if your troubles in life okay are the fulfillment of hebrews 12 5 through 11. and time and time again christians through the years have assumed that hebrews 12 5 through 11 applies to them they believe that their difficult circumstances are God's chastening hand upon them. They believe that God is getting even with them for unconfessed sin or unbelief or disobedience and all that. The chastisement of Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 has a context. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 is not describing daily troubles in this dispensation of grace. The quote is of Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 an end time passage designed to comfort believing israel during the seven year tribulation program okay during their uh 70th week of daniel the tribulation period so before israel can be delivered from satanic bondage the fifth course of chastisement prophesied in leviticus chapter 26 must be finished it started back with the Babylonian captivity way back in 600 BC. It paused when Saul of Tarsus was converted <clears throat> in Acts chapter 9. And it will resume again and conclude after our dispensation ends at the rapture. Okay, The last seven years of the fifth course of judgment will end with Jesus Christ's second coming. Now, in conclusion, the writer of Hebrews included himself with the nation of Israel. After his conversion, Paul didn't consider himself a member of Israel. You can look at that, 1 Corinthians 15 and Galatians uh, 1 15. The writer of Hebrews anticipated Israel's coming Messiah to establish God's earthly kingdom. Paul anticipated, on the other hand, a heavenly kingdom to which he would go, and we're going to, okay? Furthermore, the writer of Hebrews wasn't an apostle of Israel. He claimed to be someone uh, who heard information from Israel's apostles. Again, in Hebrews 2, verses 3 to 5. Now, this would again eliminate Paul, okay, as a possible writer of the book of Hebrews. Galatians chapter 2 is very clear that Israel's apostles uh, taught Paul nothing. On the contrary, Paul taught them doctrine. He brought them up to date to God's current program. Okay, Someone in Israel's program learned this doctrine from Paul and then wrote it down, which is why some verses in the book of Hebrews exhibit Pauline influence. But Paul didn't promote works religion. The writer of Hebrews taught works as part of salvation. Okay, Now in Hebrews, uh, it, you'll see terms to describe Jesus Christ that that Paul never used uh, himself to describe our Lord Jesus in his epistles of Romans through Philemon. No one could reconcile these two people, all right? Paul and the and, and the writer of Hebrews as the same person, unless of course they have a tradition they refuse to abandon or an agenda or some false teaching. We have no way of precisely identifying the writer of Hebrews but we can eliminate certain and several individuals we can say with certainty that Paul did not write Hebrews there's too many verses in Hebrews so many uh, verses that simply do not reflect 
Pauline theology and phraseology. In some places, Hebrews directly opposes what Paul wrote in his books. Okay, And we can see a confusion building from that problem. And we can say with certainty that Timothy didn't write Hebrews. We can say with certainty that Peter and the eleven uh, didn't write Hebrews. It boils down to this. It's very dangerous to believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. You introduce confusion in your walk with Christ. You confuse yourself with the nation of Israel and you destroy the clarity of the rightly divided word of God. It's best to simply acknowledge that Hebrews is a Jewish book to and about the nation of Israel for the end time portion of her program. Hebrews doesn't apply to us in the dispensation of grace. It's not to or about the body of Christ. The confusion concerning the writer of Hebrews is certainly another tactic of Satan to rob Christians of the knowledge of who they are in Jesus Christ. Hebrews is a great book and there's a lot to learn from it and we need to study it. We need to know what God has in store for Israel, his plans for the future, but most of all we need to study it to see the differences in dispensation so we can tell the difference between what's for us today and what's not. Knowing that keeps us from getting confused and from falling into all the traps of false doctrine out there in the world today. So with that, that concludes our study on Hebrews. Peace and grace and love in Christ Jesus be with all of you. Thanks for studying with me, saints, and I'll see you on the next video.